But first up, we are going to explore a very different topic. This is something, a story that was inspired this last Saturday night at 3.30 a.m., just a few miles from this studio where I'm standing now. One tragic mistake that cost three lives. After a night out with friends, a young man got behind the wheel of a car. Allegedly, a friend told him he was too drunk to drive, but he said he was okay to go just the short distance home. Minutes later, he caused a fiery crash and died along with the two other people in the car. In the blink of an eye, one bad decision can ruin multiple lives. It can kill. I deal with this every day, and right now we will look at why people don't get this message. Joining me to discuss, two mothers who lost their children at the hands of drunk drivers, Nina Walker, who lost her 22-year-old daughter and is now raising her grandson, and Stacy Rhodes, who lost her 19-year-old son. These, uh, Nina, uh, Nina, I'm going to start with you. I mean, uh, Emily, I, I, I'm sort of overwhelmed when I talk about these stories because I am all the time dealing with people with substance problem, warning them, take the treatment now before you hurt somebody. What do you think when you hear these stories? Well, I take it very personal. Um, I'm saddened. I'm sad for the families of the three uh, victims who've lost their life to a drunk driving crash. I'm sad for their friends. I'm sad for the community who has to mourn over an incident that is 100% preventable but happens far too often on our roadways. I completely agree with you. L let me start because I think people... The, the way we reach people is with stories. So, Nina, let's hear yours. What happened to your daughter? Well, um, a little over 11 years ago, uh, February 11th, 2011, or 2001, my 22-year-old daughter, uh, a single mom, uh, working as a waitress at a steakhouse, and was a junior student studying to be a nurse. Um, she was the designated driver that night, left the gas lamp area of San Diego, and was taking her friend home and was crashed into by um, a van that was being chased by a jealous boyfriend. Uh, she was killed instantly, which you know gives me some solace knowing that she didn't have to suffer. She had a friend in her car that suffered uh, multiple broken bones in his body, but she paid the ultimate price. She left behind a three and a half year old son that my husband and I uh, petitioned to be his guardian and are now raising him. Nina, I, I you know, myself, uh, not, not related to the kind of story you've been through, but my wife was sort of critically ill after she gave birth to our triplets, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't know if I could ever look in the face of these children if something happens to her. H how do you do that? Is it something you have to think about every day? Well, I don't think about it every day. Um, I look at my grandson, and I always tell him, I can't love you the way your mother would have loved you, but I can love you the way I loved her. And, and what do you and tell him? What do you tell him? He's getting, he's 15 now or so. He's getting an age when kids start to experiment. How do you, how do we not let this be another statistic? Well, we constantly talk to him about the dangers of underage drinking, the dangers of people getting behind the wheel of their vehicle and driving after they've uh, consumed alcohol. And when he, I tell him that I'm going to go out and speak on behalf of MAD, he always says, go out, Grandma, and make a difference. And that's what I try to do. Nothing I can do that will change the circumstances of what happened to me and my family, but I want to be able to change what could pot potentially happen to anybody. I, I can see, I'm just, you know, we've got a big image of you up on our screen here, and I've got to tell you, I can, I can see this, this affects you. It's stricken you. And it certainly has. Yeah. Let me hear Stacy's story. Stacy, you, you and your, what happened to your son? My son was 19 years old when he was killed at the hands of his best friend, Adrian. They were coming home from a party that was socially hosted. So that's kind of my platform is social hosting and what, what, not Stacey, allowing I, this I, to I happen. I want to interrupt you and ask, what you mean parents were giving kids alcohol? Is that, was that, is yes. that a euphemism for that? Yes. I got to tell you what yes. I tell my kids. I, I said if, if any adult is giving kids, is contributing to the delinquency of a minor in our state, and if my kids are there, I will show up at the sheriff's and have them haul off. No problem. I'll be laughing my butt off when they do it. You because know, I, because I, I, I swear to yeah. God, I see the consequences, and, and you're a living right. piece of that consequence of parents right. not doing that. It's unbelievable to me. Right. Right, right. It's just irresponsibility at its finest. And when Ryan was killed, 
again, there was high rates of speed, which go hand in hand. But um, the, my frustration is it's with Adrian, of course, the driver, but more incense with the parents. They played the role that I was so teaching my child and my son to avoid. And for nothing to happen to them also, that was a double slap in the face to me. Um, you know, I live with this every day, and, and our family lives with this every day in our community. And Ryan had just completed his first year of college so we hadn't seen him and to get that phone call dr. drew I cannot even explain to you what receiving that phone call is like telling you that you no longer have a child and you literally feel like you're missing a limb like you can't breathe but then to find out that it was at the hands of adults I had spoke to Ryan constantly we talked to our kids we talked to our kids about the you know the difficulties with drinking and drugs and he wasn't the driver, which was frustrating in itself also. You know, he got into a car with somebody who was extremely impaired. And friends questioned, should I let them drive? Should I not let them drive? Uh, I just, you know... I well, Stacy, so much of this is something we have uh, dealt with on this program a number of times, which is the adolescent brain, the young adult brain, particularly the young male brain, where they don't perceive consequences, they don't project things into the future, they, right. th they lack executive judgment, they're aroused by impulsivity and very arousing dramatic kinds of circumstances, they're drawn to that stuff. I want to slip a quick call in here from Amber. Amber in Wisconsin. Hi, Dr. Drew. Hi, Amber, what's up? I was affected by a drunk driver nine years ago. I was 17 and pregnant, and my boyfriend died in a drunk driving accident. Um, what young people need to realize, or all people need to realize, is that you're not only affecting your life, but people around you for many years to come even. Just like my eight-year-old son, who gets to visit the cemetery every single year for Father's Day just to say hi to his dad. It, they need to realize that it don't just stop at that one night of drinking, that it forever will go on. Were you with him that night? I was on the phone with him that night. That I was on the phone while it happened. Oh, my God. Mm. Yeah. All three of you ladies, mm -hmm. it, it's so... I've got an icy cold feeling in my gut. The three of you must have to relive these experiences every day. You can't, you can't you escape do. it. Yeah. You do. You do. You, I mean, you have good days and you have bad days. And I try to live in the memory of Ryan and what I trained him and taught him. And you, you still, you have your good days and your bad days. And you just roll with those bad days. You have to. And, and I appreciate you guys telling these stories and hopefully making a dif difference so other parents don't have to go through this. I don't know how you don't go throttle those parents that were ladling alcohol down those. I mean, not forcing alcohol down them, but allowing them to use alcohol. I, I, I just can't even. I don't know how you. you I, I'm not going to go there. Well, they're 1,800 <laughs> miles away, so, you that, know, that's That's, that's what, what it would thing. take. That's what yeah, it would take to yeah. keep my hands exactly. off, I'm just saying. Exactly. All right. Now, next up, I'm going to have you guys talk to a young man who did kill a woman when he was driving drunk. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are, you ladies are, have to say to him. You can see the car. I don't know if he was racing or, or something. And he kind of swerved onto the sidewalk, and then you see him just crash into this post, into the tree, and then into the palm tree. When I was calling 911, we could see that the, the driver, he was screaming for help. That was someone who witnessed the horrific car crash that killed three young people over this last weekend, just a couple of miles from where I'm standing now. Another drunk driving death. Joining me now, John Templeton, who he, he was with us last week, but he asked to be a part of our show tonight. Now, 10 years ago, John got behind the wheel of a car. He was drunk, he was a young man, and he killed a woman. John, my understanding is you carry a picture of this woman you killed. Can, is that correct? Yes, yes, Dr. Drew, I do. What's her name? Uh, the victim of, of my, the crash, her name was Julie Nicole Buckner. And can I see the picture of Julie? Um, it's actually my wallet. I gave it to my wife. Um, Maybe. So I had nothing in my pockets okay. with my cell phone. I can grab it, though. Well, if she is in the green room or sitting by, maybe she can shuttle it on into you. There, we have a picture over here. I'm, I beg your pardon. She, there she okay. is. She's she, a beautiful she, she young... She was a beautiful... Yes. Go ahead, John. Very beautiful. Very beautiful young woman. Um, you know, and, and uh, I don't need a picture, Dr. Drew, to remind me of, um, you know, the life that was taken. But, um, you know, that was a, a life that was cut short. And instead of planning a wedding... 
her parents had to plan a funeral for their, for their daughter when she was just 18 years old. And, um, you know, it's something that I remember every single day. Now, I'm going to ask you, John, to talk to a couple of parents who've lost children at the hands of drunk driver. I, I know you now make it your life to raise awareness about yes, these sir. things. I know you're in recovery now, but I've got, I've got the, young, the, the women up on the screen here with you now. And what do you tell these moms? How do they know that you legitimately deserve a second chance? How, how, what do they do with their anger, John? What do you, t what do you say to them? You know, Dr. Drew, um, my heart really goes out to um, both mothers. Um, you know, I've, I've um, you know, been fortunate enough to hug and, and see the pain that I've caused, um, you know, Mrs. Buckner and Mr. Buckner. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in no position to tell anybody that they, um, that they should forgive. I, I, you, know, it, you know, God forbid if that happened to my wife, I don't know how I, I would react. But, um, you know, I can tell them that, um, you know, I, I, my, my father says it was the second worst call a parent can ever get in their life was the call that my dad got. Um, you know, and I know for certain that that's the worst call a parent can ever get in their whole life. And, um, you know, nothing can ever bring back a child. Um, you know, I, 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 was, I was blessed with forgiveness, Dr. Drew, and, um, you know, I've, I've really tried to, uh, you know, take that oppor as an opportunity to change my life. And um, I can never bring Julie back, but um, every 52 minutes, somebody is killed in America. Uh, due to drinking and driving. And, Stacey, and, um, hang, hang a second, a, John. I'm, I'm, Stacey's having a little reaction to what you're saying. Do you have, want to say something to John, Stacey? I, you know, I mean, as a, as a parent um, that loses a child this tragically, um, I understand what he's saying, and I am, I'm glad that he's accepted what he's done, and he carries the picture of her around. I forgave the her Adrian, the person that killed my son. I did that because I needed to. Um, but as far as saying he, re you know, the parent received the second worst phone call, I, that just, I mean, I, I guess I'll agree with him to a point. Well, on hold that. on a second. No, you don't have to agree. It made you angry. You, there's nothing worse than what you I went am through. I'm very, well, I'm not, I'm not angry because I refuse to give those parents that anger. I refuse to put that energy out there. I am, you know, I'm devastated. I lost my person. That was, that was my person. That was my family. And unless you experience that, and I don't want to discredit the fathers that lose children. You know, I knew my son nine months before anybody else knew my son. And for him to be taken away in such a tragic, vicious manner, um, you know, it's, it's, it's devastating. It's once and again, it's once again women taking on the special burden. They have a special burden. Mm -hmm. John, do you have a response to Stacey? Make it quick. I'm going to take a call. Yes. Absolutely. No, Dr. Drew, I, po I apologize. I meant um, my father getting the call that his son was, was responsible for killing another child was second compared. That's the worst call you could get was a parent getting a call that their child was killed. I, 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 I want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm agreeing with her. Amanda in California, you have something for us? Um, yes, I um, was married to a man. I'm still married to him. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm emotional listening to all these people. Um, my husband has a drinking problem, and I kept asking him to get help. I kept saving him from driving drunk. I kept lying for him, and then it got to the point where I just I begged him for I begged him to get help, and then he got a DUI. And I told him that that wasn't a divorceable offense to me, but I'd stand by him if he admitted that he had a problem and he got help, and he didn't. But I got pregnant, and I thought I had no other option but to stay with him. And then it just got continually worse year after year. And the day he drove drunk with my children, he came home in the driveway. He opened the car door and passed out. And my kids were in that car. I called 911. I got a friend to take my kids away so they didn't see him getting in the ambulance. They cut off his clothes. He had alcohol poisoning. He was, um, I believe it was a point two nine. It was something unimaginable, point two six, to where a lot of the population would be dead. And I went to the hospital, I slapped him in the face, I told the nurse that someone needs to go talk to him about having a drinking problem, and I called his parents, and I told him, them that he was no longer my responsibility. What's happening, Amanda, what's, what's happening today? What's, where is he today? Did he get sober, or is he still out there? No, months? he's still out there, and he's still out there. He has another recent DUI. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, yeah, and he's Amanda, putting everybody's lives at risk. Amanda, I have deep, and John, I'm going to let you ring in with me on this. I have deep empathy for alcoholics. I know how it hijacks their brain. But for God's okay. sake, 
when you have nearly killed your children, you are going to kill other people. I know you, when you're in your disease, you don't care so much about yourself, but you're going to kill somebody else. You are not responsible for being an alcoholic. You are responsible for your treatment. John, go ahead. What do you have to say to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Drew, as far as the disease, um, it's no, by no, any means no, not an excuse, um, but it is a chronic progressive disease. If he's experiencing consequences and continues to drink, he has a serious problem and, and he's either going to kill himself or somebody else. Um, the man really needs treatment. It, it, it is, he is not responsible for the alcoholism, Amanda. He is responsible to take treatment and God help him if he does not. Because I, I say when people refuse treatment, when they've been warned repeatedly, I understand they're not in a normal brain state. Believe me, nobody understands better than me. But if they then go hurt somebody, it's over. It's over. They had their chance. i got to take a quick break. I'm going to keep this conversation going. We have been discussing the tragic consequences of people using substances and driving. Thus far, we've been talking about alcoholics and people driving. But listen, abusers of substances, you don't have to be an addict to get in a car and drive and cause a horrible consequence. When will people get this? Thank God in California, we have very stringent laws. Nina, I want to go to you on something. John and I said something perhaps glibly. We said you're going to kill somebody or yourself or somebody else. I think I misspoke. I think it is far, far, far worse when you hurt somebody else. I'm sure you agree. Well, as was illustrated in the previous conversation, drunk driving affects everyone. It affects the drunk driver. It affects the victims, the family, the community, uh, the personnel who respond to these horrific crashes. I watched the video of this uh, flaming vehicle and just shook my head. And but Nina, 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 you, that's all you do is shake your head. I, I would imagine you shuddered. Your whole body must have reacted to this. Oh, it, it did, it did, and it, it brings up my passion to go out and make a difference. I encourage anybody who's a victim of a drunk driving crash to reach out to MAD, become an advocate, become the voice for your loved one who was either killed or injured. MAD last year served over 63,000 victims of drunk driving crashes. Um, it's one of the secrets that a lot of people don't know about. They think all we do is fight legislation, but we serve our victims. I encourage the families of the three victims of this latest crash to reach out, including the driver who was um, allegedly intoxicated, but I encourage them to reach out to MAD. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, all three. We're going to keep this conversation going. I want to get more into this. So we got, I got a little more time left, and I'm going to get more calls in here so we can discuss this further. More to the break. Talking to Nina Walker and Stacy Rose, both of whom lost children to drunk drivers, and John Templeton, who himself, driving drunk, killed an individual. Now, here's a question for you guys. Uh, I know what my viewers are sitting here thinking. Okay, I get the grief, I get the recovery, I get all this, but what am I supposed to do? I'm going to get on the, in my car on Saturday night. I'm afraid. What's the average person to think about the problem of drunk driving on the roads? Stacy. If Dr. Drew, if we had somebody that was killed every 51 minutes or 52 minutes in this country for no apparent reason whatsoever, it would be an epidemic. We'd be wanting to know what the heck is going on, how do we fix that? That's the same with this. Drinking and driving is no different. Impaired driving is no different. It needs we need to pay attention to this. We need to do something drastic about this. This is not just a social situation or a social epidemic. We need to fix this. How expensive is it to get a cab? You know, set those exactly. plans ahead. Yes. Yes. So, so I mean, that's just how I look at it. Let me go to a caller, Christina in Idaho. I'm going to try to get a bunch of calls in this segment if I can. Christina, what do you got for us? Um, when I was three years old, uh, Four women in a car coming back from Mexico were drunk, drunk as skunks. My father was heading uh, down to the to the to the border because he was a musician, and um, these women just. 
It went with him head on. You, you sound somewhat overcome by the story. When, when was this? How long ago? Uh, I was three years old. Okay, so you lost your father at three, drunk driving. I mean, this problem has been going on forever. It just it is getting better, guys. It is getting better. John, you had something to say? Uh, yes, Dr. Drew. I mean, it's, just, it's a lethal weapon is mixing drinking and driving. Um, I, I think that education, um, really at the youngest ages, uh, children are abusing substances younger than ever, and I think that that sort of attitude leads them to, to really have a, a cavalier attitude towards drinking and driving. And, and, it's, and it's a, by the way, we live in a day and age when people are cavalier about pills and pot and other substances. These things absolutely. impair your ability to drive a vehicle as well. I know the focus has been on alcohol, but people forget your benzodiazepines, your Xanax, your Valium, your painkillers, your pot, whatever it might be, you are not driving a vehicle normally. You're not going to fly a plane. You're not going to practice medicine on those pills. You shouldn't be driving a vehicle. Suzanne in North Carolina. Suzanne. Hi, Dr. Drew. I just want to tell you, in 2009, my family was hit head-on by a drunk driver. Oh. It was in December, so closer to 2010, but one of my children suffered a cracked vertebra. My husband had internal oh. injuries and a concussion. And I was driving, so my legs and ankles and feet all had open fractures and were so oh, badly... Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And they were so badly broken that I was given a 50-50 chance of losing them both. And oh. I spent months in a rehab facility or a nursing home. Did you ever meet, my... Suzanne, did you ever meet the perpetrator? The, the... Actually, I, we hadn't met him before, but he's a, he's a local influential family around here. They run a Christian business. So I did know of his family, but he's had six DUIs and he's gotten one since our wreck. What state? You, what state are you in? We're in North Carolina. You can get. Do you guys know about this? Uh, my panel. You can get away with six DUIs, and not go to prison in, in North Carolina. Nina, you have something about that? Yeah, I do have something to say about that. It is far too common that people have multiple DUIs, which is why Mad advocates the installation of interlocks on vehicles that you have to blow before you go, so that people who've already broken the law once will um, have to blow into this device in order for their car to start. I, I, listen, Nina, you guys, I, I, although people abuse substances and get in a car and get in trouble, DUI is a high probability of an alcohol problem. Blow and go. you got to go blow on the device before you drive a vehicle after that. I'm just saying. It should be, that should be a, a, it seems to be like a national standard. Donna in Rhode Island. Donna, what do you got? Hi, Dr. Drew. Hi, Donna. I was a driver in an automobile accident. I suffer every day. When you drive drunk or buzz, it doesn't only affect you. You have to take into consideration that it becomes a burden to those around you, not w just yourself. Donna, Donna I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm hearing your story precisely. Did, are you saying that you were an intoxicated driver yourself? Yes. And what happened? Um, I, I went out to the club, and um, I had had an operation. I hadn't been out in a couple well, of What were the months. consequences? What happened? I, I, I went to pull over into the right lane. What happened? Had, I smashed into the car in front of me, and that car smashed into the car in front of them. Is everybody okay? So, um, I, I, everybody, I suffered the most injur injuries. I, I, I needed to get right to all my appointments and help getting dressed for three months because of the extent of my injuries. Donna. Okay. Nina, but Donna, go ahead. Nina, go, please. Donna, um, you lived. Um, my daughter didn't have that opportunity. Um, I've often thought about what it would be like if I could care for her, if she had uh, injuries. Um, her life was taken because someone made the choice to drive after drinking. And as Dr. Drew said, it continues on and on and on. What is it going to take to make people realize the carnage that's being caused on our roadways so that they will stop doing this? Stacey, you want to comment as well? Well, and it's not as though we're not an educated society. You hear about this all the time, but the common cliche, unfortunately, that we hear is, it's not going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm only five minutes from home. You know, that's unfortunately what happened this weekend. They were close to home, and that's they didn't right. make it home. I, and I think that's right. a symptomatic of a young mind. A young, it's, the, it's, the, it's the youth that are disproportionately affected by all this because right. of how the adolescent brain works. But, John, I'm going to let you finish up with a call for recovery for Donna. I feel as though she's still affected by her condition. What are your words for her? To, as you know, John, all the bullying, or well, not bullying, we all the sort of... Admin, you know, admonitions and warnings don't doesn't affect somebody on substances. So give her We're all something. Passionate about it. Give her, but give the Donna 
a version of how you attract somebody to recovery? Um, you know, Donna, I, I believe that you've suffered enough consequences. Um, you know, I myself uh, sought treatment and, um, you know, a life in recovery is, is it's a one day at a time. Um, you don't ever have to pick up the drink again. Um, you know, I, my family and I now run a substance abuse treatment center. So I see the effects of drug and alcohol and on people every day and the effects are devastating. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the uh, opinion of preservation for life. I, I'd rather see somebody get help before they end up uh, making a terrible choice like I made and, um, you know, and have, have to live with those consequences every single day. And I would say, Donna, it, you opened up with the, uh, describing how you'd been on medication and doctors had prescribed them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if doctors are prescribing these things. You don't operate a vehicle. And if you're having consequences, even when a doctor is prescribing them, you want to think about recovery. John, thank you. Nina, thank you. Stacy, thank you. I really do appreciate it. I mean, this is a very tough topic.